Hello, my name is Oscar and Fire, and welcome. I don't know why my brain. I got like my brain just got really distracted just now. And welcome to um, yet another book review, a book review of the Elf Stones of Shannara, and I will tell you right now, amazing book. I mean, I read it before, but I also read it like twenty years ago. Well, oh my god, I did read almost. I did read it almost twenty years ago. I was like twelve or thirteen. I was in seventh grade. I'm pretty sure. But uh, yes, I wrote. I read this book twenty years ago, like the Sword of Shannara, and I, I honestly I forgot a lot of the details. I remembered most of the basics, but the broader the broader narrative and the way it flows and everything, I kind of forgot over time. And to read it now, I, I, I literally I literally fell in love with this book all over again. I like I can't believe it. Like. I thought that reading it again, like, it wouldn't hit me. Um, that wouldn't hit me like like it did the first time. Because I remember really liking the book when I read it the first time. Um, but, holy crap, like, with 20 years more maturity and, you know, analytical skills and reading comprehension and everything. This book hit me just... I feel like this book hit me harder, actually, than it did the first time I read it. Um... It's, uh, it's, damn, I don't, I don't even know what to say, honestly. I'm a, I'm a little bit, I, I'm a little bit, um, I, I'm a little bit at a loss for words because I'm not entirely sure how to describe, like, how I feel about the book, but I, I literally just finished reading it. I just read the, I literally just read the last chapter because I got through most of it on my lunch break at work, and then I'm like, okay, well, I don't have time to read the last chapter, you know, it's like nine pages. So I just read the last chapter, and it's a very, it's a very well-written book. Especially when you come off the heat, come out, come. Off, especially when you come off the heels of the Sword of Shannara, and I talked about how the Sword of Shannara is a super derivative work, and you know it's really good, but it's also kind of bad in some ways. You know the way it copies Tolkien and the way it's kind of like very straightforward, kind of bland, and everything. You know at the same time, you know, it, and the way its first third is extremely dull, and then kind of picks up in the last two acts, I guess. Um, Elfstones, though, is good all the way through. Um, I, I, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm literally at a loss for words. I'm actually surprised at how much I enjoyed rereading it. Um, all right, so I guess, it, shut up, Harry, good lord. All right, so anyway, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm really trying to place it because, this is, it, it's such an interesting book. I like the way, I like the new ways that Terry Brooks, Trey Brooks found ways to write this book. I like the way he changed, the way he adapted his writing style and everything for, um, you know, from the Sword of Shannara, how he evolved and improved, really. Um, I like how he goes, A, for the slow start. He's went with the slow start in the previous book, but he yeah, ramps, ramps up really quickly with the, with the stalking of the skull bearers all the time. Um... But in this book, it starts off really slowly, where it kind of it, it does a lot more to establish, establish what's going on, to establish a little more about the elves and everything, and to get a sense of what the Elkris is and who the Chosen are and everything. And then he brutally murders all the Chosen, and you know, and it kind of just escalates from there. And I like I like the escalation, and then I like how it escalates in elven territory, and then comes back down again, and we see Willem Sir and Storlock, and we find Ambro in. Havenstead was the word? And his name, I mean? I think it was Havenstead. Um, and then ramps it up again, and then kind of keeps it at a pretty steady pace from there on. Um, I really like the warfare. I feel like... I feel like Terry Brooks actually has a, has a surprisingly strong grasp of medieval tactics. Like, he doesn't go into super details. But, the, but like, the formations and the strategies and everything... He, he details those things, and he tries to... He tries to explain those things in a way that's easy to access, and, but, you know, it's easy to access, easy to imagine, but isn't so complicated that you kind of get lost in the weeds, you know? Like, I'm one of the person, one of those people that would love to get lost in the weeds of the tactical details and everything, but I'm perfectly fine with how he does it. Obviously, because I'm not an idiot and think that, you know, he should explain in fine detail the exact positioning of different units, you know? That, that's for historians, you know, that, and I am kind of an amateur historian. But anyway, um, but I love it. Um, 
I, I thought that was I thought that was some of the most interesting parts of the book, but then there's also the adventure into the Wilderun and finding the and finding safe hold and all that. I thought that was I thought that was absolutely interesting. Um I like the romance. I like the little love triangle. Um you know, it's a little weird in hindsight thinking about the way that Terry Brooks keeps keeps describing Ambrose's appearance as childlike. I mean, I, I guess strictly speaking, it's not like Will's like super old or anything. He's like what mid teenager, probably 15, 16, and she's probably like twelve or thirteen. You know, so it's not like a it's not like a super it's not like a super age difference where it's creepy. But um, you know, at, at the same time though, it's uh, at least I got the sense that Will was slightly older than her. Anyway. I feel like that's why he keeps. Em I think I feel like that's why uh, Brooks keeps emphasizing Ambrose's appearance and the fact that she's younger than she is. I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. I, I, I'm not lying. I'm not gonna lie. Shut up, Windows. I'm not gonna lie though. It's 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 a little weird, but I kind of get over it because I'm still invested. Because I'm in ultimately I'm invested in the characters, and I'm invested in Eritrea. Eritrea. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but the Rover Girl. Speaking of rovers, I actually, so I was actually really surprised. Um, well, maybe I should maybe I should finish talking about the romance actually. Okay, let me finish talking about the romance. I really like it though. I like I like because because he gets you invested in the characters. They're way more invested than you're invested in any of the characters in Sword. Because he gets you invested in the fate of Will and Amber and Eretria and you know and Ander and all that. It makes it so much better when for the first three that I mentioned that you're you're interested in their fate and you're interested in what happens to them and like i'm not hit as much by i wasn't hit as hard this time by the um by um the, by the tragedy that by the tragedy of amber becoming the elkris tree this time because of course i knew it was going to happen so i couldn't be saddened by it but I still felt something for, you know, for Will's heartbreak when he realizes that, oh, he's, you know, when, I, when he, when you kind of realize that he's realizing that he's losing, he's going to lose her. You know, it, it's very, um, I think it's very, um, I think it works. I think it works really well. Just from a purely, since I really didn't feel the emotion this time, from a purely analytical standpoint, I think it works super, super well. Um... I also like I also like this sort of enigmatic not enigmatic because she's actually very straightforward but Eretria is a very is a very fun character. Um, I like I like how she's straightforward and how she what she she wants you know what she wants she wants Will and she wants Will to help her and I like how she's very straightforward about it. I like how that makes I like how that makes for a um, it's not really a character arc but it makes for but it makes her an interesting foil for the more touching and meaningful relationship of um will and amber I, I think i think i think it's really well constructed is basically what i'm trying to say i think it's put together very well i think it you attach the characters well and i think that you feel for the characters when they have to make their choices and when they realize what they have to do um so yeah i, I really like that also as a side for characters i also really like how Alanon evolves as a character. You know, uh, it's really funny because I never, when I read the Sword of Shannara, I was not, ex I forgot that Alanon was actually kind of sort of a bit of an asshole. Like, I didn't realize that the man's actually a bit of an ass. Like, he's, like, he's kind of short tempered, he's really brusque, he hides a lot of information from people. And he does the same thing here in Elfstones, but he's humanized a lot more. And part of the way that Terry Brooks does this is by pointing out that. Alanon, even though he's capable of prolonging his life through the druid sleep, he points out that Alanon is still getting older. That at the end of the book, Alanon actually has gray in his hair now, as opposed to just black hair, because he used so much magic to fight Dagdamore that um, you know that he prematurely aged himself to do so. Um, and I, I, I think that's interesting. I think, I think by, I think it helps to humanize Alanon because I know what's coming I know what happens in Wish Song I know that, that that's when Alanon dies um and I find it funny I'm trying to avoid spoilers even though obviously this is going to be spoiler written partially because I already know the entire I already know the broad arc already but um 
But I know that he's already gonna die, but I think that the... I, get, I, I bet you when I was a kid, I really didn't pick up on the foreshadowing that he was gonna eventually write that, yeah, Alanon is eventually going to perish. Um, that Alanon is not immutable and that Alanon will not be around forever. And he's a lot more likable in this book too. He's he's a much more he's much more of a reassuring presence than he was in the Sword of Shimano. You know, his existence he, his existence is far more um, grounded and down to earth. And he's there to support Ander Alessadil and to support the elves and and I also like that implicitly. So, you know, Alanon's a druid, and he has magic and everything, and he shoots blue fire out of his hands. It's like Emperor Palpatine with fire, even though this these books were written before Return of the Jedi. Um, but, you know, it, you know they, but I like how he's reserved with his technique. Like, he's reserved. Like, he doesn't just go in magic blazing all the time. You know, he goes in a very specific moment to repel breakthroughs and to fight the Dagnamore and everything. He's not just trying to... Um, you know, he's not just leaping in there, being the hero. He's he's being measured and calm, and it's kind of and it's kind of like an under it's kind of underlying and kind of reinforces the idea that Alanon can't just spend all of his energy all the time. He has to temper himself if he's going to be any of any use to anyone. And I think that's actually really clever writing. I like that. Speaking of Dagnamore, I find it really funny that in the early part of the book, like the first quarter the Dagdamore as a character and then literally just disappears all the way into like chapter 48 and then reappears only to be killed by Alanon. I thought that was real I thought that was really amusing. Dagdamore, by the way, if you actually haven't read the book and you don't care about the spoilers, is the um, the demon in charge of the greater demon horde that is invading the four lands because of the failing of the elephants. Um, I'm not gonna go into huge details because that's not super relevant. You probably should read the book yourself anyway, but um it's too late for that because you already know half the details here. Um, and I kind of did spoil the big Alanon's gonna die, so I probably should put a spoiler warning at the beginning of these videos. I just thought of that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that for this one going forward. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, I thought that was kind of silly. I thought it was silly that that Terry Brooks just sort of totally dropped Dagnamore as a character, rather viewpoint character or background character at any point. And just and then just reappears suddenly towards the end. It's like okay, that's that feels like a bit of a of a writing oversight. Mm, excuse me. Um, but yeah, all right. So let's get into. Oh yeah. So a couple of things surprised me in this book. A couple of things surprised me. First of all, rovers. I did not realize rovers first appeared in the Elf Stones of Shannara. I because the first time I remember rovers being particularly important in um in the Shinar series was the voyage of the Gerald Shinar, where of course a rover crew with an airship travel across the travel across the across the sea to um you know to find the uh to find the the what seemed like what is it like some sort of military base of the old world probably in like Russia or Japan or something um that's the first time I remember there being rovers I don't remember rovers all the way being back all the way in the Elfstones of Shinara let alone one being a major character in the Elfstones of Shannara. Um, but yeah, that, that surprised me. And the other thing that surprised me was the fact that the Federation is first mentioned in this book. I didn't realize the Federation was that old. I didn't think the Federation existed until the Legacy, I think that's a series, you know, the four-part series that follows Wish Song. Um, but the, the Legacy of Shinar, I didn't realize that the Federation... I thought the Federation existed then. I didn't realize it, it was actually formed in the immediate aftermath of the um, the Warlock Lord's, um, you know, third invasion. Um, and that means that I'm actually going to have a bit of a, a, bit of a rant here. Um, because... Because I was going to have this later when the Feder when I thought the Federation first appeared. Well, it's realized it appears now, and it's like, well, it's timely to have it now then, because it's even worse now that I've read now I realized that I that it began, in, you know, in the years between Sword of Shinar and Elfstones, and that is why is the Federation still a thing in the Fall of Shinara? Okay, so listen, listen. 
The Federation is a big government. It's a huge government. It's ex it's it, it, it's a it's a it power that's very expansionist in nature, and and it wants to maintain its power and everything. It's mostly oligarchic in nature and kind of swings back and forth between authoritarianism and more Republican form of government. Um, you know, and, and it's just why does the Federation still exist though? Because the Federation lasts for. I can't. I don't remember how many years are between the Elf Stones and the Coral Shinarans. Over a thousand. I know that it's like probably closer to like thirteen hundred years or something between Elf Stone between the Sword of Shinara and the Fall of Shinara. And you know, it's it's stupid long time if I'm recall correctly. It's something, or is it that long? Is it thirteen or is it just a thousand? That's a very long time. Either way, I really could probably look it up, but I'm not gonna bother. Um, but, but it's a, but yeah, anyway, it's a really, really long time. And I kind of like, I don't understand, well, I guess I kind of understand because I'm pretty sure that's kind of burnout in some ways for Terry Brooks, but I don't fully understand why Terry Brooks kept relying on the Federation as a crutch for his storytelling because after a point, the Federation just got boring. The Federation became a very boring element of the story because it as it dominated every story, every story ended up started getting like started like going back to Arashag all the time. And they kept going back to the way the Federation's influencing the four lands, and it's it's a very dull storytelling element. And frankly, the Federation, being the being the kind of government it is, the Federation should have died a very long time before that point. Uh, they should have died a very long time before the Fall of Shinar, because. It suffers two major setbacks. I think in the High Druid of Shannara, I think it is is when the uh, when the other races and lands rebel against uh, the Federation's the Federation's domination of um, the four lands and win. That right there should have weakened the Federation substantially. And then in the Dark Legacy of Shannara, when the demons sack Arashag, that should have been it. That should have been the end of the Federation right there. Man. There should have been no... There should have been no possibility of the Federation rebounding from that, from that, because no autocratic, no autocratic slash oligarchic regime is going to survive the, the decapitation of its government. It's too big to, to survive that kind of, that kind of a shock to its system. I mean, it would survive, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a big government and it wouldn't collapse completely. But it would shrink. It would change. It would become a different entity entirely. And I don't understand why Terry Brooks never tried to do something different with the Federation. He just doesn't. It just It's still there. It's just always there. It's there ubiquitously for most of the series following the legacy of Shannara. And I just don't... I don't know why he did that. Because there's so many more creative things he could have done. Including, first of all, I, first of all, I definitely believe... But mo most of all, I would say, rather... The Federation deserved to die. The Federation was a terrible government that did terrible things. And it was oppressive. Again, it was like autocratic in nature. Um, or oligarchic, I should say, rather. But it's like an, it's like a, it's like an autocracy that's ruled by an oligarchy. Um, uh, but just in terms of like the way it, you know, way it governs itself and the way it polices itself. Um, but the Federation... I know, and the funny thing is, the Federation is not really a big part of the story, but I'm still talking about it because it's, I think it's important to bring up. Um, but the Federation is a, you know, the Federation is a big drag on future stories after the legacy of Shinar, I think. Um, and I, and I just, I wish he had done something different with it. I wish he had taken it more seriously, uh, and I wish he had taken its history more seriously and realized that, hey, these various shocks to its system occur that should change the federation because there's very few governments on the planet they that have existed for a thousand years and there's very few that have existed in the same state um over the course of a over a course of like that thousand years you know a couple of you know it's like like france has kind of existed for a long you know for that long england has existed basically for longer than that actually but these nations have changed over time you know England grew and became Britain, and then it became the empire, and then shrank again, and the power of the king has ebbed and flowed over time. Sometimes the wars have more power, sometimes the king has more power, finally the parliament has power. 
Um, stuff like that, you know, that, that that's all stuff that's worth noting there. You know, and then you have, um, you know, and then you have, like, say, France. France is a little more consistent, but even then, France has been, you know, has been rife with chaos. And then the French Revolution in the late 18th century completely upended everything, you know. And, and so it's like France has existed as a country, but France has completely transformed multiple times in its history. Um, and then, you know, let, let's just take the United States and, you know, in almost two and a half centuries, the United States hasn't changed too much fundamentally, but this, the United States suffered a brutal civil war and it saved the world in two world wars and, it, you know, all sorts of, you know, it, you know, has all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of things, you know, you know, the United States started with slavery and then abolished it in the civil war and. You know, there's all sorts of elements that, you know, that you can change. But the Federation feels like, it, unless I'm forgetting something, which I could be, mind you, but the Federation feels like a good, like a largely unchanging entity over the course of its existence. And that's, and just from a purely storytelling perspective, that's such a bad thing, you know? I mean, I've been kind of thinking about it, and I'll tell you right now. What I would have done is that, first of all, in Dark Legacy, because the last two series, I think, are Dark Legacy, Defenders, and Fall. Um, two of which are behind me on my tall bookshelf now. Um, but what should have happened is that Arashag is sacked in the Fulshinar. Nothing about that changes. And, but you know what? That should diminish the Federation. The Federation should become a smaller state. Arashag maybe gets abandoned. Maybe Arashag becomes an independent state. Um, you know, some stuff like that. You know, some things like that where, you know, you know, the Federation splinters, becomes, you know, becomes fragmented and... Minor governments pop up all over the map again. Maybe Calahorn is reborn. Stuff, you know, stuff like that, where the Federation is no longer the big dog of the Southland. And then the Defender series could be more, say, instead of being a trio of really boring, loosely interconnected stories, like Defenders of Shinar could be about the Druids rising. Um, I feel like we never, I feel like we never get a chance to see, like, the Druid order as a whole be like the defenders of the four lands. They're always being subverted from within, or there's only one left in the case of Alanon and Walker Bow, or they're trying really hard to stay out of the affairs of the four lands. You know, they're always trying to do stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, but instead it's like, what if the Druids actually were rising as the defenders of Shannara? And in, the, in this book series, you know, the Defenders of Shinar can still be like a group of loosely interconnected stories. But, but instead of making them boring, make them about how the Druids are slowly establishing, reestablishing themselves in the absence of the Federation. And how they're bringing people together. They're bringing the elves and the dwarves and the trolls and the gnomes and the men together. And I literally did that in the directions that they live in, in the Four Lands, if, if this is the South. But, um, but, you know, imagine, you know, the Druids are bringing people together. And then for the fall of Shannara, you know, like, they're trying to maintain a cohesive alliance. You know, it's been several hundred years, of course, now. And they're trying to maintain a cohesive alliance in the face of some sort of threat. Maybe the Scar, maybe something more interesting. Um, you know, but they're trying to maintain this alliance and, you know, things change. Things actually change. And... Maybe some, you know, maybe some druids you come to know die, or, and, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the, maybe the elves, like, suffer, you know, suffer. Maybe the trolls become a dominant power. Maybe the dwarves become a dominant power, because the dwarves have always kind of just been in the background. Um, you know, stuff like that, you know, you can, you can play with this idea so many different ways, and Terry Brooks just never does that. And speaking of all that, you know, it's funny because in this book, in this book, and much hay is made of the fact that the elves, the elves are aided by the, the trolls of the Kershaw territory, dwarves, uh, a dwarven sappers from Storlock, uh, not Storlock, uh, uh, Culhaven, you know, arrive to help, and men from Calahorn arrive. You know, these four races united together in common purpose against an enemy that's literally insurmountable. Um, and the Fall of Shannara has nothing like that. The Fall of Shannara is all about the Federation and the Federation, you know, 
um, drafting some dwarves into their force. But the elves are completely absent, even though the elves created the druids in the first place to try and unify the races. The elves are back to being a bunch of isolationists again, and the trolls are mostly annihilated. The druids are annihilated. You know, I'm just, you know, like, this book ends with hope. This book ends with so much hope, so much good feeling. The Fall of Shinar ends on a wet fart, literally. Almost literally a wet fart. You know, and it's just... I don't know what to tell you. Like, like, it, like it, just thinking about it really kind of aggravates me. Because this, this, I put it down again by picking up again. <laughs> this is such an amazing, fun, good book. It's not quite fun, it's actually really dark. But it's, it is fun in the way that it's good. It's such an amazingly good book. And the fact that, you know, like 28 books later, it's a complete, you know, the series ends as a complete disappointment, really frustrates me. There's so many things he could have done. So many ideas. You know, like, like, like the, world's is, the world's Terry Brooks's oyster. And he just, just, he just fails. He just fails to bring it home. You know, he has all these hopeful ideas in the Sora Shannara and the and the Elf Stones of Shannara. I know the wish song I know the wish song gets kind of dark, but you know, I mean and I, I mean the, the books don't have to be purely hopeful or anything. The Shannara's always been kind of dark. But the broader messaging is there and it's so totally absent from the Fall of Shannara, it's disappointing. Like there's a like there's a hopeful ending to the Fall of Shannara, but A the the title of the series doesn't really... The title of that four-book series doesn't really match it. And... I don't know. There's more hope here than there is in there. Um, so, yeah. I, I feel like I didn't talk about the Elf Stones enough in so much as, I, as, as much as I talked about the other things. But, but yeah, I, I really, really, really love this. Um, I, I unfortunately have the, the cracked version that is like the tie-in version with the Shannara Chronicles television series. So it's not going to match up with the other books I have, which are just the New York Times bestseller versions. But, yeah, so. Elfstone's done. Loved it. Recommend it. I know I spoiled the whole thing. You should read it anyway. You should read it anyway. Um, which song's up next? Um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I know that it gets dark. I know that I know that I know that wish song gets super super dark. Um, you know, bad things happen. I already spoiled one of those things. But I'm not going to do it at the end here. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Really looking forward to to continuing the Shinar series. After this will be the first king, and then I actually have to start buying the next. Have to start buying the legacy of uh, the legacy of Shinar, the four book series. Um, about the scions of Shannara. So, yeah. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, I really, I really, even though I'm kind of tired today, I really, really wanted to do this video, so. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed me rambling. In fact, hold on, before we, before we go, let us, I gotta be this slightly, actually. But we're going to, we're going to add the, the Elstone, we're gonna clean this up a little bit, too. So we're going to add the Elf Stones of Shannara to the bookshelf. That's going to tip over. Um, where's my bookend? There's one there. Do I have a green one? I should have a green one. Green bookend, where have you gone? Are you still here? You're probably, you're probably somewhere. Did I use you for something? Green bookend. Oh, well, that's fine. Anyway. Uh, yes, so... Um, so yeah, uh, th th yeah, just, just yeah, yeah. Look, see, bookshelf. I have to move Hubble's universe. I think I might. I think I know where I'm going to move because I have the other Shannara books on this shelf, but they're also sharing at the Chronicles of Berdane, which are better than the than the last two series of the Shannara series. So um, probably going to rearrange it a bit, give him give him more of a place of honor. But uh, you know, give, give the Hubble's universe maybe more of a place of honor than those books. Kind of hide them over here on this end of the bookshelf. Anyway, so yeah, thank you for watching, and uh, yeah, I'll probably be, still have to work on those Final Fantasy XIV videos, but we'll worry about that another time. Anyway, thank you for watching again, for the fourth time, pretty sure that's the fourth time I said it.
and I will definitely be back to talk about the Wish Song of Shannara probably in about three or four weeks. Uh, yeah, seems to be about the... Maybe, no, maybe closer to two or three. Anyway, until next time, everybody. <laughs>